Chapter 9 Wreckage And now comes the strangest thing in my story. I remember clearly and coldly and vividly all that I did that day until the time that I stood weeping and praising God upon the summit of Primrose Hill. And then I forget. Of the next three days, I know nothing. I have learned since that I was not the first discoverer of the Martian overthrow. Several people had already discovered this on the previous night. One man had contrived to telegraph Paris. The joyful news had flashed all over the world. Men, weeping with joy, began arriving on trains into London. The church bells rang out again until all England was bell ringing. Food arrived from across the Channel, across the Irish Sea, across the Atlantic. Bread and meat came for our relief. All the shipping in the world seemed to be heading for London in those days. But of all this I have no memory. I drifted, a demented man. I found myself in a house of kindly people who had found me on the third day wandering, weeping and raving through the streets of St John's Wood. I learned of the fate of Leatherhead. Two days after I was imprisoned, it had been destroyed with every soul in it. I was a lonely man and a sad one. They were very kind to me and they bore with me. I remained with them four days after my recovery. Then after a tearful parting, I went out again into the streets. Already they were busy with returning people. In places, there were even shops open and I saw a drinking fountain running water. I remember how mockingly bright the day seemed as I went back on my melancholy pilgrimage to the little house at Woking. There were people everywhere, busied in a thousand activities. But then I noticed how yellow were the skins of the people I met, how shaggy the hair of the men, how large and bright their eyes. London seemed a city of tramps. The churches were distributing bread sent us by the French government. The ribs of the few horses showed dismally. Haggard special constables with white badges stood at the corners of every street. I saw little of the damage caused by the Martians until I reached Wellington Street. There I saw the red weed clambering over the buttresses of Waterloo Bridge. At the corner of the bridge, too, I saw a sheet of paper against a thicket of red weed. It was the placard of the first newspaper to resume publication, the Daily Mail. I bought a copy for a blackened shilling I found in my pocket. Most of it was in blank, except for advertisements. At Waterloo, I found the free trains that were taking people to their homes. There were few people in the train and I was in no mood for casual conversation. I got a compartment to myself and sat with folded arms, looking greyly at the sunlit devastation that flowed past the windows. Hundreds of out-of-work clerks and shopmen were working on repairing the lines. Beyond Wimbledon, within sight of the line, were the heaped masses of earth around the sixth cylinder. Over it was a Union Jack, flapping cheerfully in the morning breeze. The red weed was everywhere, creating purple shadows. It was very painful to the eye. I got out at Byfleet Station and took the road to Maybury. I walked past the place where I and the artillery men had talked to the hussars. I stood by the spot where the Martian had appeared to me in the thunderstorm. Then I returned through the pine wood, neck high with red weed. As I came home past the college arms, I saw the landlord of the spotted dog had already found burial. A man standing at an open cottage door greeted me by name as I passed. 
I looked at my house with a quick flash of hope that faded immediately. The door had been forced. It was opening slowly as I approached. It slammed again. The curtains of my study fluttered out of the open window from which I and the artilleryman had watched the dawn. No one had closed it since. The smashed bushes were just as I had left them nearly four weeks ago. I stumbled into the hall and the house felt empty. The stair carpet was ruffled and discoloured from where I had crouched, soaked to the skin from the thunderstorm, the night of the catastrophe. Our muddy footsteps, I saw, still went up the stairs. I followed them to my study. I found lying on my writing table still, with the paperweight upon it, the sheet of work I had left on the afternoon of the opening of the cylinder. In about two hundred years, I had written, we may expect... The sentence ended abruptly. I came down and went into the dining room. It was just as I and the artillery man had left it. The mutton and the bread were both far gone now in decay, the beer bottle still overturned. My home was desolate. I saw the folly of the faint hope I had cherished so long. And then a strange thing occurred. It's no use, said a voice. The house is deserted. No one has been here these ten days. Do not stay here to torment yourself. No one has escaped but you. I was startled. Had I spoken my thoughts aloud? I turned and the French window was open behind me. I made a step to it and stood looking out. And there, amazed and afraid, even as I stood, amazed and afraid, were my cousin and my wife. My wife, white and tearless, she gave a faint cry. I came, she said. I knew, knew. I made a step forward and caught her in my arms. Chapter 10 The Epilogue There is much that we still do not know about the Martians. In the bodies that were examined after the war, no unknown bacteria were found. Nor do we know the composition of the black smoke. The generator of the heat rays also remains a puzzle. Scientists continue to study the evidence we have. Our views of the human future must be greatly modified by these events. We have learned now that we cannot regard this planet as being fenced in and a secure place for man. It may be that this invasion from Mars is not without its ultimate benefit for man. It has robbed us of that serene and foolish confidence in the future. The gifts to human science it has brought are enormous. It has even done much to promote our understanding of our common humanity. On the other hand, it may be that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve. Perhaps the future belongs to them and not us. I must confess the stress and danger of the time have left an abiding sense of doubt and insecurity in my mind. I sit in my study writing by lamplight and suddenly I see again valley below in flames. I go out into the Byfleet Road and vehicles pass me. I put your boy in the cart a workman on a bicycle, children going to school. But in my mind, I am hurrying again with the artillery man through the hot, brooding silence. In my dreams, I see the black powder darkening the silent streets and the contorted bodies. They rise upon me, tattered and dog-bitten. I wake cold and wretched in the darkness of the night. I go to London and see the busy multitudes in Fleet Street and the Strand. It comes across my mind that they are but the ghosts of the past, haunting the streets in a dead city. And strange too it is 
to stand on Primrose Hill and see the sightseers about the Martian machine that stands there still. I hear playing children and strangest of all it is to hold my wife's hand again and to think that I have counted her and that she has counted me among the dead.